you'd work with director Emma Tammy before. What was your first instinct? What were your first thoughts when she like rang you up and said, I want to do this movie based on this really popular game franchise about deadly giant possessed killer, you know, killer robots. <laughs> what do you think about that? Yeah, it, I am not a gamer or I haven't been since like the 70s and 80s, which is great because so much of the context is from the era for when I grew up playing Atari and early Nintendo. So that's kind of my era. She had explained what you described and I, I was very intrigued. And then I read her script and why I love working with Emma is that she, you know, she also finds the hearts of things. I think the most successful films are the ones you really pulled in by the characters. Hi, this is Mike. I was just calling to see if that job that you offered was still available. Yes. The security guard. I will take anything. Um, I think we were both giddy just having those initial discussions about like, what are the possibilities of this world and, you know, how do we create the tone of it? What the heck? And speaking of those early discussions, I was wondering, like, what sort of research do you do? Because, of course, you, like you said, you just told me you're not a gamer anymore. But, like, do you study, you know, footage of the game and stills? And I mean, it's the yeah. interesting thing, I guess, is that it's very much a game series that's so much driven by the visual storytelling by and also by the framing of the images as well. So I guess that must have been really interesting. It was absolutely fascinating because, yeah, this is my first time working with a project in which there's already so much built canon into something. I mean, I think that was the one of the first things she said to me too, is like, read the script, come over, let's play the game. And we played the game together. And she was like, take a look at these things, do this. And so it became my own research. I bought, I think every book that's been made by Five Nights at Freddy's beyond <laughs> just the gameplay, but just to get an understand of just how rich everything is. And what was actually to my advantage is I have a nine-year-old daughter. As soon as I started having all this material around and also buying figurines and other things, I mean, instantly she's like, what are you doing? And I start playing the game. She wants to be involved with that. So I, I inadvertently brought in kind of an unofficial research assistant with me because every, <laughs> as she started watching all the YouTube series, everything, and she would just tell me every day, like, some new aspect she learned. So firsthand, I saw how, like, uh, you know, how captivating the gameplay is to such a large kind of audience. Mm. Um, and it was important for us to bring in the tonal aspects that the, why the game was so sex successful, even the first one. I mean, it's a very first person player element. You know, you're limited in what you can see and what information you're given at what time and certain types of scares. We really wanted to match that tone that makes that game so successful. And certainly there's lots of nods. I mean, we the security camera footage is so important. We knew that had to be important. There were nods on how we were going to frame things, Easter eggs throughout. And then beyond that, uh, creatively, it was other, other films we looked at just internally, um, especially like Jurassic Park was... I think a very important one because of what is wonderment in one aspect then becomes a complete horror on the other. And, and you have Abby who sees things through a different viewpoint versus Mike. Hello? And just that idea of what you see as magical as a child is, can be completely horrific as an adult. You know, we looked at other tonal movies, Poltergeist, you know, um, the thing as well. Uh, I, I, th I just think like the idea of paranoia. Uh, Emma and I also talked a lot about The Shining. I was like, I want the Freddy Fazbear's to be like the Overlook Hotel of pizzerias. You know, it's like mm. not only the animatronics, but you really want this place of suspense and you don't quite know what's around every corner. You know, it's, it's like Danny going through the hallways of <laughs> the Overlook and that feeling of dread. And so those were kind of just our inspirations beyond just what was already there. You but, mentioned the animatronics. And I just want to hear, you know, I, I, it's a twofold question. First of all, you know, working with those in a creative way, making them, lighting them, so that making them scary, working with them in a creative way to make them interesting in terms of the movie, but also the practicality of it, of working around these huge, this huge machinery with so many puppeteers and 
involved, the, the challenges that are in that. So both the creative and the practical challenge of working with these machines. How was that? It was awesome. Uh, yeah, Jim Henson Company is like, it was a dream realized. I We started doing camera tests very early with them at the Creature Shop here in, in Burbank, just to understand, yeah, how do they photograph? What type of lenses are things going to look distorted? How's the fabric going to look under certain lighting conditions? And with the puppeteers, how they move, how the joints move and this and different configurations. It took me back because at the same time, too, when we started to do the test, it was the 40th year anniversary of the Dark Crystal. And I had seen that as a kid and was absolutely amazed. And in their shop, they had all the original figures out for display. They really are masters of of the fantasy world and and making these things come to life. I think there were so many teams, you know, involved with just making sure that they can work well on set. And, you know, that was just an exciting aspect to be involved with. Visually, I love the fact that the world outside the restaurant seemed to be, you know, deliberately a bit of drab. Like there was a lot of yellows and grays and browns, which make the contrast to the restaurant so much clearer. And the neon lights, the arcade lights, and this really emphasizing that you're stepping into a different world. I, was that a deliberate choice? It was. I, I, you know, Emma and I discussed early on just kind of, you know, you've got what's Freddy's and everything outside Freddy's. And certainly we wanted that contrast of a real life and then when you go into Mike's perspective of going in and then certainly Abby's perspective, because that's very different. And then even within that, there's arcs and, you know, as as the nights progress, you know, which it, from a creative point, it's a really fantastic thing. You know, you have this kind of ticking time bomb element. You know, there's five nights of Freddy's. You're taking that step ladder. You know, for Emma, she doesn't want to hit you right over with 10. You know, you got to you've got to build, have these gradations and you've got to build somewhere. And that's very important to her. So yeah, it was a very conscious discussion to have a aesthetic that's inside and outside Freddy's. Ghost children possessing giant robots. Tell me how to stop them. He don't. It's too late. He's coming. <laughs> no! 